That's how relationships are built. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Relationship Led Growth Live. I'm Joseph Lewin, and today I'm flying solo. Usually it's going to be, uh, Mike's going to be on the show, but he and Gabby are actually leaving to, uh, to Greece to, on a sabbatical, so super excited for them. But today we're going to be talking about personal brands that drive business relationships. And today's episode uh, is going to be structured a little bit different than normal. Uh, so typically, Mike's going to make an introduction and go over um, go over his thoughts on something, and then we're going to go back and forth. Uh, but today, we're going to break this down into a couple segments. So the first segment is going to be me sharing about how personal brand personal brands are like an egg. You know, you can see the outside of the egg, and that's what most people think of. Uh, and with personal brands, that's that's the content. But there's actually a couple elements inside the egg that are not as easy to see that make up a successful personal brand that's going to drive business relationships and ultimately drive results. So I'm going to share about that for a couple minutes. And then I'm going to invite a couple friends to join me to share their experience on personal brands. So one at a time, I'm going to bring on uh, a couple of friends that have built the business relationships with me through uh, personal brands. And I know that they are really good at building relationships um, from there, from their personal brands as well. And then we're going to end the show with uh, our typical opening up the floor to you. So I'd love for you to jump on live. Uh, I'd love for you for you to ask your questions or share a little bit about your experience growing your own personal brand. So without further ado, let's dive in. All right. So. What you're able to see on the outside of a personal brand is, is the content. Um, and I feel like when I've heard people talk about personal brands and for a long time, my perspective was, uh, oh, thanks for jumping in, Juan, and uh, thanks for jumping in, Alex. Super excited for you guys to be here. Um, also, I'd love to hear where you're coming from. So type in the chat if you're joining us live and, and let me know where you're joining us from. Um, and ask your questions there, always feel free to jump in. So, you know, I always thought that personal branding was, was content and, you know, the people who I thought were building the strongest personal brands and were going to get the most value from their personal brand were people that are really, really good at creating content. Um, but in reality, there's a couple other elements that make up personal brand building that are really important. Um, and hold on one second, somebody who's going to be joining me later, and I'm going to make sure they're able to jump on. Thanks for, all right, so there's a couple other elements that really drive, oh, thanks, John, for joining us from Lisbon, uh, Atlanta area, awesome. Yeah, so a lot of times, it, uh, like I was saying, it's it's about content and people think about personal brands as the content that's being pumped out there. Um, and the people who who we typically see as the people who are getting the most results are, are people that focus on content. Now, personal brands and content, uh, they go together, right? So I'm not saying personal brand building isn't about content. And, you know, over the years, I've personally created some content that I, I have seen some pretty good results from. Uh, I have some posts that have done really well over the years and some of these posts and, and some of this content ha have led to opportunities. So um, I have gotten podcasting opportunities and speaking opportunities from individual posts and, you know, those doing well and people seeing it, sharing my point of view and, and people getting excited about it. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on some two other elements that are, are a little bit harder to see. Um, and the good news about these two elements is you don't have to be great at creating content to get the value of building a personal brand. The two other elements are, are things that anybody can do. And in my experience, these actually lead to an outsized impact, even more so than the content you're creating. Um, and be before we go any further, I just want to talk about the word brand because a lot of people think of, of branding as being, you know, something that's visual that the, the icon or the mark that you rep that, that you recognize, but really what a brand is, is 
the reputation of a company kind of encompasses the entire reputation and, and how the market views a particular company. That's their brand reputation. And yes, the icon and, and the marks are part of that, uh, but the brand is really the reputation. And that's true for personal brands too. So a personal brand isn't just the, the content itself, but it's, it's a person's individual reputation. And so when we think about building a personal brand, um, I feel like a lot of times people think of it as something that's selfish. Uh, if you're going to build a personal brand, it's just only for your own good. It's only uh, so that you can further your own career or your own ideas. But I don't believe that that's true. Um, when a company is, is full of employees that have a strong personal brand, it's full of employees that have a strong reputation in the market. And they've gone out of their way to show their expertise and to show their knowledge. And if, it, if a company not only uh, embraces personal brands, but empowers their team members to grow their own personal brands, it's building the reputation of the company at the same time as each individual person is sharing their expertise and, um, and their reputation. All right. So what are the two other elements of building a personal brand outside of content? Um, it is relationships and engagement. And the reason that relationships are at the core is that it's the way that you view the, the goal of building a personal brand. Uh, so for a long time, I got this completely wrong. I thought that a personal brand was all about content and then you engage with other people so that they see your content and then relationships are kind of like the outside or the icing on the cake. Uh, whereas now my view is completely shifted on this. And I think it's the most important part of building a successful brand that helps drive business relationships uh, is actually doing this the other way around. So in my view, building a personal brand is about building relationships with people in the industry and not doing that so that you can make a sale or so that you can get some kind of opportunity, but really looking to build relationships with people that you can add value to them, that you can share your expertise, you can give opportunities to, and then people who also will do the same for you and people who will give you opportunities and uh, people who will uh, uh, end up you know, bringing value to you at the same time. And if the reason that you're engaging with people and the reason that you're uh, building your personal brand is to build relationships, it really changes, changes the game. Um, and then the second element is engagement. And so in order to build deep relationships with people, um, you really need to uh, you really need to engage with them. And this isn't just commenting on people, people's comments on your posts. It's looking for ways to engage with other people in the community um, by engaging on their content, commenting, um, sharing their content and making other people look good. So that's kind of stage one of engagement. Stage two of engagement is uh, I'm going to take this slide now here. Yeah. So stage two of engagement is, okay, how do we go beyond the platform? Um, and my friend Eddie's going to join me in a little bit. Eddie, can't hear you or see you yet. I'll bring you up here in a, in a couple minutes. Um, so the second part of engagement is really where the rubber meets the road. It's going from the comments and thinking about commenting and engaging on the platform to how do we take that engagement off of the platform? And that's where you really start to see the value of, of uh, personal brand building. And that's where you really start to see the, the benefit come is when you're going, okay, how do, I, how do I take this interaction from the comments to maybe direct messages? And then from there, how do I end up meeting this person, whether that's meeting them at an event or um, asking them if they jump on a call with you for coffee or asking for their advice or sharing advice with them. Um, and that's where live shows like this one really provide, a, provide a, a way to start those conversations because you can invite people to come on your show. Um, or, you know, in my, my experience, I have a podcast. And so that opens up doors to invite people and take that relationship to the next, to the next level. Um, and then from there, when you're trying to engage, you know, go from content to engaging to going off the platform, that's where you're going to start to learn and, and really bring, um, bring those relationships into the next level of, um, of value. Uh, and so I'm gonna take a second and share a couple of stories and then I'm gonna bring Eddie on. So 
there's one story in particular that I've shared before on the show, but I'm going to share it again because uh, to me, this is the biggest impact that I've had from building my personal brand and kind of shows the whole life cycle from beginning to end. Um, so Gabby Grinberg, who is one of the owners of uh, Proofpoint, where I'm working, I started seeing her content show up in my LinkedIn feed and she posts really great content. It's really authentic. Uh, she posts about employer brand. So talking about Proofpoint and our perspective on uh, at, as an employer and, and the kind of company that we're building for the team that works here. So I started commenting on her posts and she commented on some of mine. And then I started seeing her husband, Mike, show up in my feed because I was connected with Gabby. And um, I commented on some of Mike's posts and then he ended up commenting on a post of mine about lead generation versus demand generation. And he gave the best response I've seen from anybody on that topic. So I invited him on my podcast to share about lead generation versus demand generation. Um, and it was a great, great episode. And he said a few things on there where I was like, man, I really need to ask his advice on something. So I uh, asked if you jump on another call with me. And at the end of that call, Mike said, hey, I have this job opportunity. Um, I think you'd be a really good fit for it. Would you be interested in, in applying? Um, so I applied for the role. And that's the reason I'm on the show to begin with. And the reason that I'm sharing that story is it kind of goes through all of those pieces. So I was looking to build relationships with people through the podcast and my personal brand. And then Mike and Gabby were looking to do the same thing through their personal brand content. And because we're both actively engaging and open to having conversations with people that won't necessarily immediately lead to anything, uh, good things happen from that. And then the second story I'll share is um, something that's actively happening right now. So um, about two years ago, I started seeing somebody named Martin's content show up in my LinkedIn feed. And um, he was posting great content. We ended up uh, engaging on each other's co content, commenting back and forth. Then I reached out to him and asked him if he'd jump on a call with me. So we chatted and nothing came about from that. Um, you know, nothing solid. Fast forward until about a month ago. Um, and I reached out to him. I started seeing his content in my feed again and said, hey, I'd love to catch up sometime soon. Um, and he said, hey, I, I don't have time to catch up right now, but I have somebody that, that you need to meet. So he introduced me to another fellow that runs a marketing agency. And I was thinking, well, this is another agency. It's just a good opportunity to connect and network. So I get on the call with this fellow and it turns out that his company is focused on a different kind of marketing and they're really looking to scale what they're doing and they need exactly what it is that we do at Proofpoint. Um, and so we're you know, in, in conversation and it, it looks like there's a good chance we're gonna end up working with them. Uh, and that opportunity came about from being open to and actively looking to build relationships with people that weren't necessarily leading to any kind of opportunity immediately, but then those kinds of relationships that you can build through uh, your personal brand end up leading to opportunities uh, over time. And so I'll wrap up by saying, if you shift your mindset away from trying to get attention through your personal brand, and then uh, towards building relationships, and then you shift your relationship, your mindset about relationships from, um, from the idea of what can I get? How can I get somebody to buy from me? Or how can I get somebody to give me a job? Or you know, how can I get something from this to how can I meet people who are going to be influential in my, in my career, who are influential in the space and how can I give something of value to them first? And if you make that mindset shift, that's really where you end up seeing the value and the power of personal brands. Um, all right. So with that, I'm going to bring my friend Eddie on. Uh, he's going to share a little bit about his experience building personal brands. Eddie, welcome. What's up? What's up, man? Good to have you on. Yeah, so I'm just going to real quick uh, share about how we met. So Eddie and I met through both of us building our personal brands. Um, I started seeing his content show up in my feed. You know, we comment back and forth on each other's stuff. And then at my previous company, um, I was working on a piece of content and I needed somebody that had Eddie's expertise. It was about influencer marketing and manufacturing. And so we ended up um, recording a, an episode together. And, uh, and then, yeah, we've been friends ever since. We've both moved jobs since then and um, have had some, some great 
back and forth. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, super excited to have you on, man. Heck yeah. It's solid to be here. You're making some really good points. And I'm excited to kind of piggyback off of them because you clearly get it. You've clearly seen the benefits and you understand it. So uh, I'm just happy to provide perspective for sure. Yeah. So I'd love to hear from you, you know, just first of all, what kind of value have you seen from building your personal brand? And I know you've been in sales roles and marketing roles. So you kind of mm -hmm. seen it from both sides. So what have you seen come from building your personal brand? I mean, it's been huge on reaching my potential because like a big thing that that is this really underneath the soul or my surface, if you get to the soul of who I am, it's about maximizing the potential of who I am as, as a father, as a friend, you know, as a, as a content creator, as all these things. And to me, when I first started um, kind of wanting to go down that specific road and create a personal brand, I had to be very careful, though, because I was like, OK, there's a difference between what gets the most attention or what's true to you. And I think there can be uh, a really good melding of the two because I've made the mistakes. Right. And, and, um, and I've and I, I've learned and done a lot of testing. And, and believe it or not, at a past life, I was that guy that would take the shirtless pictures on Instagram for free fitness um, uh, apparel and free. I mean, I got all kinds of free stuff. But then I realized I was only getting those things. Uh, when I would remove clothing, you know, and I'm like, ah, this isn't right. And so um, I had some issues really at first trying to figure out, oh, do, do I stay? Do I, do I need to be authentic or am I even interesting enough? You know, do people are people even going to care? Do I try to give them this theatrical facade so that it, you know, creates the quantifiable dopamine shots that we get? But um, it's been a long, awesome journey. But really, it's, it's changed my life in more ways than one just by starting and being authentic. I know it seems pretty simplistic, but just those two things um, have brought me a lot of opportunities, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about more here in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. So maybe you could give me an example of a piece of content that you've created that you've seen relationships start from that um, that surprised you. Like basically what I'm getting at is a post that you've posted at some point and I'm putting you on the spot here. So it takes you a second, to come but you know, something you posted where you go, wow, this really didn't do good. It's not like an, ex you know, you didn't get 10,000 engagements on it or something like that, but it ended up leading to, to an opportunity uh, or a relationship with somebody that's had an impact. Sure. And I, to kind of go back to it, I'm, I don't even know if there's even like one specific post, but there was a bunch of ones that didn't go viral. Everybody has this, this essence of, I just want to go viral. I'm going to get all these six, seven figure numbers. But, but I would say what's done me more justice and served me more and added more value in my life than the couple six and seven figure posts that I didn't think we're going to do well, were me just being consistent in those middle to lower range ones. Because I think what, what helped my personal brand more than anything is individuals seeing more of it day in and day out. So I don't expect people to pop up like, okay, this guy's, King stuff here. I want to start subscribing immediately. Where's that bell? I don't expect that. Um, information is, is a commodity in 2023, and, and content creators are no there are no exception to that specific rule. And so, really, that that being said, I mean, my funny content definitely has done more for me than anything. I will say that um, because I in the manufacturing world, nobody wants to be funny because everything has got to be you know, serious, real American strength. But in all reality, there's a lot more jokes going on um, in the industry than what a lot of people realize. And that being said, without digging too much in the industry, because I do believe it has lots of strength. I also feel there's, there are great stories not being told, great jokes not being told. And humor works in so many different human scenarios. So why are we not applying it um, in, in that world? So I use that to my advantage to create just a couple tongue-in-cheek humor, funny videos. And even though those videos didn't go viral by any means, some of them did very, very well. Um, it was just being able to humanize that and allow people to laugh and then directly connect to the brands that I associated with that, that, that really did wonders for me. And, and you're talking about the relationships they build for you. When people see, if they see me do a serious video and they see me do a funny video, that's still like edutainment, if you will, they're going to very much remember the one that made them laugh a little bit. And that's not, that's not just for content creators. That's across the board. So um, funny, humorous content that's humanized has, has given me more opportunities and more feedback and more insight than, than any other types that I've done before. Yeah. So there's one thing that I've had visibility to, and I know you've had other opportunities like this, but, um, I, I, I'm guessing that it came from you creating that content, uh, that video with me, but then my previous employer ended up, uh, part solutions ended up having you come 
uh, and speak at industrial marketing live. Uh, I think it was last year, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right. Right. So just kind of, and that really stuck out, that event in particular really stuck out to me because a bunch of people ended up getting together that I've been seeing on LinkedIn for a long time. And it's like the culmination of these relationships, right? You, you see all these people uh, outside of the real world, but then to see a bunch of people I've met and interacted with who from different areas and the, like, I believe Jeff Long was there and Joe Sullivan, mm -hmm. you know, and people from Part Solutions and you, and there's a few other mm -hmm. people too, who I met, um, from totally different areas. And then to see them all in one place, uh, you know, speaking at the same event, uh, that really spoke to me to the, to the power of building those kinds of relationships that kind of, that transcend the platform. You know, it's not just you guys comment on each other's stuff on LinkedIn, but you actually mm -hmm. spoke at an event, you know, you get reputation from, from doing that, but then meeting all these other people face to face and, you know, taking those off platform. That does matter. And I'm glad you bring that up because if you're looking for specific opportunities, like I got to speak at Fabtech last year, you know, and I, I was a rookie on the scene and, and the guy who didn't, I, it was just so surprising to me because it was my goal when I first started doing my personal brand within manufacturing. I said, if I can speak at the big show, if I could speak at the big show, right. And get asked to go there. Um, and I did, which was nuts. And I, I can tell you that was 100% because of the content that I put out. Another example, and actually I'm going to go back to Fabtech again this year. So that's me staying consistent. Um, uh, Advanced Manufacturing Expo. I went there. You had your Megan Zimbas. You had you know, your Jake Hall. You had a bunch of well-known names that I got invited there last year. Um, and we're able to plug and play these relationships and as a group add value to speak to other individuals um, and not just to go meet up with each other and have a buddy-buddy. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an accessory to the process. But those examples are huge. Um, I mean, another thing, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at, um, I, I got asked to be a judge for Clash of Trades, a huge industry show, right? Um, and that was 100% an opportunity that came from the content that I've been producing. Um, my job now was because of the content that I've produced. Any of these speaking opportunities and these additional things that I have that, that, that re are brought to me, I can directly attribute to my work on LinkedIn directly, because if you remove that from the equation, I'm no longer connected with these individuals. And so that's why I'm a believer and have been and continue to be until a greater uh, force acts upon me. So uh, last question I'll ask you here, because I know you've been in, in sales in a sales role. I'm not exactly sure what, what your role entails at the moment, but um a lot of salespeople think of LinkedIn as a place where they go, they do some research on in Sales Navigator, and then they pitch people through the comments. And that's kind of like, or I mean, through their, through InMail or something like that. And that's LinkedIn, right? So um, what do you see the value of salespeople in building their personal brand? Because I, I mean, the, the pushback to that is salespeople are busy. Building a personal brand takes a lot of time, especially if you're going to build relationships and have conversations with people that aren't ready to buy right now. And you're going to engage mm -hmm. with people in the comments on your stuff and on theirs, and then you're going to create content that's all time consuming. So why, why would it be worth it for a salesperson to do that? Or do you think it is? I spent 10 plus years specifically in sales before I transitioned to marketing. I've read all the books from all the important people, looked at the strategies, made all the calls and stuff, tried all the social selling and this and that. And anybody who tried to come to me and say, hey, LinkedIn, is this going to be a waste of time? I would argue that if you as a salesperson, are you more successful or less successful if you get in front of more people? Very loaded question because I've been in sales. It, it is obviously beneficial to you to be in front of as many eyes as possible. Would you agree that if you have a tool to get in front of more eyes that requires low bandwidth and possible return, would you entertain this? That's me being a salesperson again because the answer is, of course, you should. Because um, at the end of the day, like, it's, it is a great tool to get you directly in touch with decision makers. Now, pitch slapping is definitely a thing. Um, that's a great play on words, but also a good example of, of what not to do. Um, and I would argue that with, with consistency, you can build that brand up and you can be the person to talk to, right? When people want to talk about their marketing programs and they want to talk about influencer marketing or doing content strategy or buddy branding, they call me. They don't call me to help you improve your golf swing or to buy you know, hydraulic equipment or whatever it may be. But there are individuals out there that when people are searching and they're looking and they're doing research, they know, hey, Joe Blow is that guy who's the expert here. And if you want to be the, the, the expert in your specific world or at least viewed as an expert, 
Um, all you got to do is show up and make a little bit of noise. And, and, and you're not going to attract everybody at once. That's not going to happen. Uh, but you're going to attract some individuals and then you're going to attract more. And then you're going to attract more. And then you're going to get to a real good point where people come to you and say, hey, what are we doing next and how much do you charge? That's when you know. So LinkedIn is a, is a tool, but don't be a tool when you're using it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, see, two follow-ups. Uh, one is Brian Cheney asked if you still have a six-pack. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to show us on air because you're past that stage of your life. <laughs> uh, you know, to be honest with you, 100%. 100%. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, yes, yes, I 100%. I would love to show you, but this is a rated. I don't know if this show is rated, but... Yes, I can Still confidently say stuff. that I do. I can confidently <laughs> say that I do. I love it. Um, yeah, and the, the only other thing I'll say, just kind of following up on the sales aspect of it is so many salespeople get the idea and they've had training on being a trusted advisor and the people I've seen that are the most successful in sales um, have focused on relationships. And they, you know, a lot of times a good salesperson gets brought in somewhere new and they go back to the people they've been building relationships with for 10 years, 20 years, and, you know, bring those people with them because they've built trust in the, in the market. Uh, but then for whatever reason, sales gets this reputation and people think of sales as just being, Hey, go pitch a bunch of people who have never heard of you before and get your pitch perfect until you can like reach out cold on a call or, or an email. And I'm not even saying there's no place for that ever, but to me, it's way more effective to build that rapport up front through posting content, engaging with people, building those relationships up front, being able to be seen as a trusted advisor um, and before you ever have that conversation. And then when you go to reach out because that person's a good fit, they're going to they're gonna say yes. And I mean, you brought up Jay Call. He's in the manufacturing space. He's in sales. And he gets, I, I just saw a post from him where he, he had 300 selfies at one event. And that's mostly people coming up to him, asking him to take a picture. So as a salesperson, when you go to an event, do you want to just be chasing everybody down? Or is it better if all those people are coming to you, asking you to take a selfie? And if one of those people is a good fit for you, you, you don't have to, it's the icebreaker, right? They did it for you. So uh, definitely think there's value in, in, in doing that as a salesperson. Well, Eddie, thanks so much for taking some time to jump on. Always good to see you. Really appreciate it. Likewise, yo. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm going to bring Dan Sanchez on in a second. Uh, I'll just bring you up actually now, Dan. Let's go. Dan the man. <laughs> thanks so much for joining me, Dan Chez. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you jumping on. And uh, this is really, again, a representation of personal brand building from both of us that led to, to you know, our, the relationship that we have. And um, I'm just going to take a second and share about the impact that you've had on me and my and my uh, career, and it's come through kind of another trail of personal brand building. So I've been building a personal brand, and since I was in the manufacturing space, I was connected with a guy named Joe Sullivan. He has a podcast, uh, and I think that it was a Sweet Fish podcast yep. originally. Um, so because I was connected with Joe and engaging with his content, I see James Carberry, your former boss from Sweet Fish, showing up yep. in my LinkedIn feed. James had said some awesome stuff over time. I was following him. And then he talked about these groups that he was starting. Um, so I joined into one of his, his groups and um, I wasn't going to be able to make one of them. So I reached out to James and I'm like, James, I'm not going to be able to make this because I'm going to be in Orlando. And he goes, Orlando, I live in Orlando. I'm going to buy you some food. Uh, so he came and picked me up with um, classic James. Yeah. He came and picked me up and uh, we had lunch. And uh, I actually was just in Orlando again and we met up again. It was awesome. Um, and, you know, first of all, James hasn't necessarily gotten anything directly from me, but he is a great example of somebody who's looking for and purposely going out of his way to build relationships with people, whether it, he sees an opportunity there or not. And by doing that over and over and over again, um, opportunities come his way, you know, and there's, yep. there's, uh, value that comes from it. Anyway, during my lunch with him, um, I was telling him, Hey, I'm, you know, I feel like I need to be making a move in my career. There's not a lot of opportunity where I'm at. And, um, I'm talking with him. He goes, okay, you need to start a podcast and you need to reach out to Dan on my team. Uh, and I'd already been seeing your content for a while in my feed. Uh, but James made an intro. We jumped on a call and you go, Joe, you need to start a podcast. You need to call it the strategic marketer. 
let's do this. You know, and from that conversation, I started the strategic marketer and um, that's ultimately, you know, I shared the story earlier, how I met Mike and Gabby, who I now work for and the reason that I'm even on the show in the first place. So Dan, <laughs> thanks for building your personal brand and being willing to jump on calls uh, and build those deeper relationships. Dude, thanks for actually executing. Do you know how many times I've given the advice? Hey, you want a better, you want to level up and get a better job or jump to another whole nother place? Start a podcast, start interviewing all the hiring managers, which comes out, stayed out of drain, uh, James's book, uh, Content Based Networking. And I'm like, this is what you do. This is how you do it. Here's how you form the episodes. Like, break it down to baby steps. You're like one of the very, I think one of two that I've told that of dozens that is actually executed and saw the fruit from it because it worked, you know what? it takes time, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not as hard as people think it is. They just, they just don't want to do it. They just want to apply to a job and get it as a guy. Yeah. It's actually kind of funny because there's been a few people that have applied uh, at our company and they just, it ended up not being a good fit. And I uh, had conversations with them afterward and I've told them that. And for some of those people, I've been seeing them still applying for months and they're and they, the excuse was, I don't have time. And I'm like, but you have time to apply to 50 jobs a week, but you don't have time. You don't have time. Are you working full time? <laughs> no. Then your full time job should be looking for another job. I, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing about that too, is I'm like, well, look, I get it. Like maybe you don't have the skill set to, um, to do a podcast yourself, you know, to edit it and all that. And I get that. We'll do it as a, a LinkedIn live. You can get sure. StreamYard for 30 bucks, do it live you're still getting the value of building the relationship with the other person and uh, you know, you're still getting it, but yeah, a lot of yeah. people don't do it. <laughs> the execution and the relationship building, like you've been talking about on the show the whole time. Yeah. So I'd love to hear from you, your perspective on um, you know, personal brand building, but specifically um, the value you've seen, like the relationships you've built and the career value you've seen from building your personal brand. Yep. Um, it's so funny because I've, it's, I've come, I've been on the, I was on the total opposite side when I was in high school. Like I was afraid of people. <laughs> I was so nervous and I was so shy. I, I had a hard time like picking up the phone just to order pizza, man. I was that kid and it was, it was ridiculous. And I think part of me inside was kind of like this introvert, always aspiring to be an extrovert because I wanted to have friends. I wanted to influence people. I wanted to be out front. I like, I wanted to be that kid, but I wasn't, I was like on the complete opposite side, but I think enough of me just drove me into doing silly and being awkward and making a fool of myself until eventually I got at least used to speaking up, at least used to even being in a sales role and knocking out phone calls or getting up on stage and making a fool of myself. Um, I can't say it, it, even that bled into marketing. The first thing I got into marketing was like your direct response type of stuff. I wanted to be good at social media. I was even a social media manager, but I was just taking over brands that maybe already had traction there. And I was just kind of posting stuff. Um, so I got into, you know, running paid media, doing landing pages and converting them and doing the email follow-up and all that kind of stuff. Didn't know how to grow on social, even trying. I really didn't know until I started working for Sweetfish. I knew everything else, but how to actually build real relationships. I knew how to sell things. I knew how to market. I knew how to build websites. I mean, you and I are kind of like generalists in that we know how to put together all the stuff, but I didn't know how to build actual relationships. And it wasn't until our, uh, you know, common muse for us, James Carberry, who honestly is like, I mean, you probably know more, uh, you, you work at a whole company. It's about relationship building. But for me, James Carberry is like, I don't know anybody who does relationship better than James. He's either. literally one of the most generous people I've ever met. Like hence he'll, he'll have a acquaintance and just be like, you're coming to my town. I'm picking you up from the airport and I'm buying you food. It's a very James thing to do. <laughs> Who does that? If, you, if you try to pay for that food, dude, that guy will backhand you. <laughs> like I'm, I'm pretty sure I got an angry face out of him after I snuck around the corner and paid for it like way ahead of the check. Um, he's just that kind of guy, but he has systems for building relationships, ma starting relationships, building them and then turning them into super friends. Like, and he works the system consistently. Hence, they wrote the book on content-based networking. But just working alongside someone like that rubbed off on me and got me to start doing a lot of the same things he did because I was working for him and his company, um, bringing my marketing stuff that I knew in. Um, but honestly, learning learning how to do his stuff as well. He got me connected to LinkedIn. He got me to building relationships here and introduced me to lots of cool people I call my friends now. 
And it's made all the difference for my career. It's made all the difference. It made a huge difference for a sweet fish. And now it's starting to make the difference for element. Yeah. So I think the part that I started to learn really just before I met James is probably six months before I started to go, okay, uh, I want to get better at SEO. I take a bunch of courses on SEO. And at the very end, they go, okay, we've given you all this information, but what it really comes down to, this is a HubSpot course, what it really comes down to is you need to get backlinks. And the best way to get backlinks isn't to go out and, and, and mine for the, you know, cold email form. It's to build relationships with people who also manage really successful sites and backlink to each other's stuff. <laughs> and so really like the success came down to relationships. Then he took a class on uh, PR from this uh, former like journalist turned PR expert guy. And, you know, it's all the, you know, same thing, lots of taxes, yep. lots of taxes. At the end of the course he goes, but what it really comes down to is you need to build relationships with journalists to the point where when they need a good story, they come to you. And it's not just yep. you sharing about all the stories that you want them to share. You just share tons of stories with them that have nothing to do with you, you know, aren't going to help you in any way. And when they know you're a trusted source for stories, they're going to come to you. Or then when you have a story that isn't as interesting, but you need press to it, then they're going to hook you up at that point and share that story. So, you know, I just kept hearing this theme of like, okay, to be successful. And then it goes back to things that I'd heard from, um, you know, Gary Vee back in the day, things that I didn't really understand. And, and Neil Patel actually is kind of similar. I didn't understand. These are both guys who super successful on social, right? And got their start through social. And they both talk about the relationships that they built with their early subscribers and their willingness to go out of their way to build relationships with like a nobody that they can't, you know, that like it's not, they weren't a super successful person. It's just a guy behind a keyboard with the name, like, you know, I like wine 299 on YouTube. And Gary Vee's like mentions them in his book yep. because he was building these relationships and putting that first. And then once you do that a lot over and over and over and over again, then those relationships start, uh, you, you start building those relationships at a much bigger scale. You know, and yep. I know you talk about audience building, but in my experience, the audience building starts with one-to-one -one relationships first, 100%. then one to yep. few. And then once you've done that enough, people who have never met you start feeling like they know you because their friends know you and their friends know of you. And some of their friends have met you before. And then some of their friends' friends actually know you personally. And it's like, when do you really take that seriously? One of my talking points is taking the, essentially what everyone is so, no, thinks is true now. You've heard of like the thousand true fans theory, mm -hmm. right? It's a very popular blog post written a long time ago, but people still talk about it. Like if you could just have a thousand tr tr true fr fans, you can accomplish anything, right? You could, you could, you can live, you could be independently wealthy. You can do so much. I'm like, Let's flip that over a little bit. Let's call it a thousand true friends. Like stop trying to build the fans and trying to generate your thousand true fans. Like, dude, nobody cares. Like be build the thousand true friends and you will be fine. <laughs> Which yeah. I think is what James Carberry is well on his way to doing. Like James Carberry probably actually already has a thousand true friends already um, in his iPhone contact book, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, if you can reverse and engineer it that way, it also makes it way easier. You're like, you don't have to try to run around and get so many people interested in you, which is kind of what generating of fans yeah. looks like. Look at me, look at me, look at this award, look what I got. Instead, if you flip it over and be like, well, I'm trying to generate a thousand true friends. Well, that looks like, you know, how to win friends and influence people. It looks like me yeah. being interested in people. It looks like me being helpful, entertaining, being what they need. It, it totally flips it over. Yeah, and I mean, two two thoughts on that. First one is, to get to a thousand friends, you start with 10 and then go to a yep. hundred and then go to a thousand. Yeah. So like you're, you're, you're not going to start out on building a personal brand that drives business relationships. And on day one, have a thousand people that are interested in what you're doing. And, you know, some right. people get lucky. Right. And I think people like the stories of like the underdog, the person who posted once on a platform and it went viral and they got 5 million views and it led to all these opportunities like that happens, but that's like trying to get wealthy by winning the lottery. Like, yeah, it's lightning I mean, in a bottle. Could. Just to <laughs> manufacture it. If we could, we'd do that all day, but yeah, like yeah. good luck, you know, <laughs> and, and you need luck to do yeah. that. But if you start out, you know, going back to the egg illustration, what you just said is okay, the focus is normally the content so that you can build an audience of people who get your point of view. But you're saying flip that around and focus first on how do I engage with other people? How do I build these deep relationships? You know, the relationship first. In, by engaging with those people, 
And then when I'm posting content, those people are now interested in what I have to say because I've been interested in them. And then when enough of those people that I've been interested in them are interested in what I'm doing, now their friends who I've never met become interested in me too. And that's and then game. that's where you really start multiplying those results is once you once you do that. And that's that's the very beginning stages of audience growth. I mean, if you don't if you don't have anything to start with, everybody has that. Everybody has that lever they can pull. Of course, there's other ways you could supplement it. Like some people start with something if you're a company. Element 451 has stuff, a budget. You know, I could run paid media and build build an audience slow, slow and sure that way. But we're also hitting LinkedIn hard, building one to one relationships with people who are in the higher ed space because that's kind of where you build the stronger essentially what you you start building like real relationships that then become your you some people call them super fans you could probably call them super friends because those are the people who go to bat for you when yeah. you really need them to you're like hey when you reach out and have the ask post you know it's your friends that are going to show up and do and do the thing you're asking them to do or check the things or give you the critical feedback you need in order to make all the little changes you need to grow um that's kind of one of the advantages of having an audience of friends is that you're in it together. Like I wouldn't be here today doing all the stuff I'm doing without a thousand little pieces of feedback I've got from all my friends on LinkedIn over time. Even this like little well, this way, hashtag Danchez that came from feedback from a few good friends. I mm -hmm. ran a poll and I would have gone with something else, but now Danchez has become a massive part of my personal brand. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of friends and relationships and some people leaning into the comments being like, Hey, you should do this. Here's why. And because I had a relationship with them and trusted them, I went with what they said, ended up being right. Yeah. So I, uh, I want to kind of wind towards the end, end of our, our chat here, but one, one thing that I'm leaning into with our, our clients and that we're really looking to do is help companies value personal brands more of the people on their team. And, yeah. you know, especially the sales team, because usually the sales team talked about it earlier, sees LinkedIn as, you know, go pitch a bunch of people and, you know, get their contact information and all that versus um, if, if you have five salespeople and all of them are just posting one time a week on LinkedIn and they're showing their expertise and then they're engaging with the people that comment and then they're getting on calls with people to add value and be a trusted advisor. Yep. I have seen it personally and I believe that you're going to see way more results come from that than those guys just cold calling and cold emailing a bunch of people. And from a marketing perspective, you're going to see more value come from empowering the personal brands of your employees than you will from five posts on your company page. Now, if those five people are really serious about it and they're posting once a day, now you have 25 posts a week. And so not all of that's about your company, but some of it's going to be. And then, you know, when, when somebody has seen the face of the salesperson, and they feel like they know them. And then that salesperson reaches out to them and says, Hey, I think what we have would be a good fit for you. Would you be open to a call? 10 times more likely that person's going to jump on and, and, uh, and, and be open to it. And I know, you know, at Sweetfish, you guys were kind of leaning into that. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Dude, it works. It's, it's a fantastic way to go at Sweetfish. We formalized it and called it our evangelist program. And now I'm even trying to create documentation and cor a co whole course around the concept to help other people do it because there's a lot of nuances to it. People ask questions like, well, should they only post about the company? What should they change about their profile? And there's all these little nuances to it. But generally what you just outlined is the gist of it. Just get encourage them to post about what they're interested in that makes sense in the context of LinkedIn, right? Um, and in doing so, they're putting out the things that they're interested in. You probably have buyers that are interested in the things that they're interested in. It might have nothing to do with your company. Yeah. But because they are into, I don't know, gardening and doing square foot gardening in their backyard or something like that. And your buyer is like, oh, I'm into that. And then they connect and they engage. But now they're engaging with that one employee. But because that one employee is engaging with other employees, they're starting to see yeah. the whole company come through their feed now because LinkedIn's a social network. It keeps track of who's connecting and engaging with who. And if you have a good ecosystem where your employees are engaging with each other and are engaging with buyers, it pulls them in. And then all of a sudden your feed Absolutely. will become full of people from, from that company. So if you, and that's where I like to give a little graphic profile treatment, which I just did for element. Um, so that when they see a employee from your company, they know it because it has that similar treatment. That's where you can get some more bang for your buck as yeah. far as investing in a program like that. Just putting some, a little bit of design into their profile so that everyone's got a similar looking thing. 
um, cause it creates a lot of synergy that way, but it's about the relationships and relationships connecting on all kinds of subjects. Cause there's no way you could plan for all the things your buyers are interested in. Sure. You stay to your general topics, but you don't know whether what they're interested in. You don't know if they're a star Wars or Disney nerd, yeah. but if your employees are out there posting about that stuff every once in a while, it's those little like hooks that you put out there that help people connect like Velcro, man. And you I get them with it. that, then they get pulled into the rest of your company. And then of course they run into the thought leadership pieces too and start becoming acquainted with your company's point of views. Yep. And that's true of people on your team who aren't in sales too. You know, it could be an engineer yep. that's doing, you know, stuff or somebody in HR or whatever, employee branding, you know, finding uh, people for your team. We've seen that yep. a lot. Almost everybody on our team, not everybody, but almost everybody's come through a personal brand of somebody on our team. And, you know, that connection um, is, is, you know, what led to people being on our team. But if, if somebody's thinking about working with your company and they see somebody from the product team, somebody from the customer service team, somebody from, you know, HR, all posting about things about your company, they're going to be way more likely to feel comfortable because with the big challenge is trust. Like yep. I get pitched from people all the time, but if you came to me and you pitched me with something, I would, even if I'm not interested, I'm at least going to schedule Give a meeting a with you at the very least, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I trust you. And then because I trust you, I trust that you're going to be working somewhere that's legit. And I'm going to associate a lot of this trust that you've built with me as an individual to, to your company. Um, all right. I have one more person to, to bring on. So unfortunately you have to wrap. We should <laughs> do this again more often, but Dan, any last thoughts on personal branding or, or any other advice that you'd like to share? One last piece is if you're on the fence about how to build a personal brand and you think you have to have it buttoned up before you begin, just start, let it be awkward. And in the process of posting and figuring out those relationships you build, they'll start to give you feedback that will inform what your personal brand should be. Absolutely. So don't think you have to have a polished personal brand because you're seeing everybody with these nice personal brands and like neon signs and stuff. Like you will figure it out in time and you will figure it out within the community. So don't stop don't not start today because you don't have it polished and a message and all that kind of stuff just try your best to be you and the community will help you figure it out you'll figure it out together it's way more fun it's way faster and it's part of actually building relationships is getting that kind of feedback anyway absolutely and linkedin of all the platforms i've been on people are nice on here for the most oh, part yeah. you'll run into a crabby person every once in a while but 99 percent of people are going to be wanting to see you be successful and i think it's the fact that it's your face tied to your actual name tied to your company makes people be a lot nicer than they might be if they're anonymous on YouTube. But I've seen way more, you know, just people looking to help on here than anywhere else. So if you're going to start somewhere and you're afraid of that, start on LinkedIn because it's people it's, will we're nice help here, you. unlike Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or YouTube. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks again and uh, look forward to yeah. seeing you around LinkedIn. All right. Got one more guest to bring on. Hope you guys are are uh are enjoying this i see some some of you guys posting in the comments um any other questions or anything you have definitely post them um and we'll bring that up in a minute and then if you have a thought or a question that uh, you'd like to share uh, i'm going to post the link um in the comments and um you can copy that link and uh i'm gonna just make sure it's going over to linkedin and jump on and uh, I'll pull you into the feed here in just a second. All right, so my final guest is uh, Brian Cheney. Gonna bring you up, Brian, how's it going? It's going good, how are you doing? Good, yeah, this is kind of impromptu to, I mean, really to have everybody on, but uh, yeah. we ended up just connecting the other day again uh, and I was like, hey, uh, I know you know this stuff too. So I think you yeah. have a slightly different perspective and we didn't actually meet from personal brand building um, but I know that you're out there using a, a show to build relationships with people and, you know, it's yeah. a way to go be, and, you know, you're not, I don't see you posting, you know, posts as often as I do other people. And maybe you just don't show up in my feed, but, you know, I know you more from the relationship building side of it than the, the, yeah. the content side itself. So, um, I just want to get your perspective on, uh, on relationship building. Yeah, well, and, and just to start off, uh, like Eddie, I also have a six pack that I'm not going to show on the show. So um, it's it. there. It's it's amazing. Um, 
he and I can compare one day maybe, but um, yeah, yeah. I'm so I have, I guess uh, before uh, probably a year ago, I've really not been opposed to LinkedIn. I've known that it is a powerful tool. I've known that it's a great relationship builder, but as a, it, it, I had a marketing company and, and um, you know, we had a team of 20 and I didn't really need to be front and center. And because I didn't need to, I just, I, by nature, I'm not interested in it, being an influencer and building a personal brand. But as I, I, I sold my company, had my exit, and then I'm looking at what I'm going to do next, I realized how stupid that was. <laughs> like, like I should have been out there. I should have been, you know, building more and more relationships. And be, because, you know, like you, you say a lot, our personal network is where the most value comes into with our company, um, especially when, when you're a smaller company, right? Um, so, yeah, I just feel like I, I wasted so much opportunity on that side. But um, still, I mean, I just don't have time to post and comment constantly actually my company does that my my company now does that for people but it's a the kind of cobbler shoes uh scenario where um we, we just don't get to my stuff all the time but yeah the the one thing that we do regularly is every week i do a linkedin live and i'll tell you a couple things one i did my first linkedin live in november and I got on there and I was like, oh my goodness, that dude needs to lose some weight. I mean, I, it, and I, I'm, I'm, it's funny, but I also, I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I hated the way I looked. I hated the way I sounded. I said, um, too much. And, and I really, I almost quit because I just thought this is, I, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to turn people off. Right. Um, but the thing I realized is like, I'm going to meet these people, the people that I'm going to sell to. I'm going to like, they see me. It's not like they see this different version of me, right? They don't hear a different version of me. And so why don't I own it and just put myself out there? And I've, I've talked a lot. I'll let, let you comment on that a little. No, I, I love that perspective. And I think, I think that's a really important point because when it comes mm -hmm. to communication in general, it's something that people feel like you either are born with or you're not, because we all know somebody who's naturally yeah. a good communicator or, you know, naturally looks good on camera. Um, and I wasn't born with those genes. So <laughs> I'm not going to have that. And, you know, we, I had, um, I was just talking with Dan Sanchez and he said in high school, yeah. he was the awkward kid. You know, I'm kind of like that too, by nature. I'm not going to be the, at a big party. I'm not going to be the center of attention. Um, I like, getting attention, you know, so it's not, it's yeah. not because I didn't want it. It's because I am not naturally good at getting people's attention. I'm not naturally good at holding on uh, a group, like a conversation in a group, but one-on-one -on -one, yeah. I'm great at that. Like if I go to a party, I usually find one person and talk to them for like the whole time. And um, so then, but I think LinkedIn and some of these platforms lend themselves more to people who are, are kind of more introverted like that because they can hold on real genuine conversations with people uh, and you can facilitate one-on-one -on -one conversations. But then to yeah. your point, it takes practice for most of us to be able to get on camera and talk without looking like an idiot and yeah. without saying tons of filler words. And that's something I'm definitely still working on. Um, and you just have to own it and you have to own who you are and you have to own where you're at. And it takes just rep after rep after rep. So if you do that yeah. live show every week for months and months and months, in months of uh, months of doing it, you're going to be better at it. You're going to be more polished. You're going to sound better. Your ideas are going to be more clear. Um, yeah. So yeah, I love that. Yeah. And I think uh, this, this is on a live you guys did several weeks ago, but I, I hadn't really thought about it like this, but if you do one live, there's a lot of pressure, right? You have to get it right. You have to have the, have the right message. Maybe you do slides up. And the reality is, Probably if you, if you do one live, not very many people are going to see it, right? Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be lower on the algorithm and the people that do see it, you know, that, that they're going to want more if it's good. Yeah. If you do one a week, 
the pressure comes off. Because if I have a bad week, it's just not a big deal. Also, as I do them, I, I and I see this in the reporting, my views go up and up and up and up. Um, uh, on the show, we don't have... A, We've had, a couple times we have, but most time we don't have people popping in. I'll, I always try to get. I love when people pop in. It's great. It, uh, you get a lot, lot better conversation going. But the afterwards, I mean, I get thousands of views on these things, and and again, I was very self conscious about the way I looked. And and I mean, and I, and this is me like thirty pounds lighter from that time, so I still got some work to do. Um, but. Uh, in that, when I, I I would meet with prospects, people I didn't know that I met on on LinkedIn, I would get on I, I get on calls with people, and one, it's awkward because they talk to me like they know me, mm-hmm. and because they, they've heard me, they've heard me joke with David, who I do a lot of, of shows with, and the other thing is I've had a couple of people that are just like, it's you, like you're oh I didn't like you got the background and you're the guy and and. I'm like, yep, <laughs> it's me, but it's a big deal to them. I, they feel like, like I'm a, I'm a star, you know, it's just weird. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And I, I think that's really getting at the core of what, when you're doing all three of those elements, cause I don't want to, when I'm yeah. talking about the egg and I'm saying, you know, the contents to shell, I actually think yeah. it is one of the least important parts of driving business relationships because you can focus on relationships and just engage with people and see more results than somebody who focuses purely on content and doesn't mm-hmm. do the other two things. But when you do all yeah. of them together, you start seeing that happen where like I've gone to an event, to events and people take a selfie yeah. with me and are like, Oh, it's awesome to meet you. I can't believe I'm meeting you in person. And you know, that's, if that person's a prospect of yours, uh, hello, <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. a much better way to start the relationship than, pitching them through the, through LinkedIn, you know, or pitching them through yeah. email or cold calling them in the middle of dinner. Like it, you're starting off on a much better foot when they feel like they know you before your first conversation. Yeah. And I think with video specifically, this is the key. Like I am a very interesting person. Uh, so I, I guess I, I deserve to be famous, but the, the, honestly, I, you, you, me, we're both normal guys. Uh, the the fact that we meet somebody and they're starstruck or whatever is weird, but it's because so few people put themselves out there like this. I yep. think it, it's it's probably less than one percent of LinkedIn users do use video, and because of that, if you do it, you stand so far above everybody else. All the other people that are talking to them, all the other people that are you know pitch slapping them in their in their messages. Uh, you're going to stand above that. Um, and I had another another really good point, but that that's the biggest thing is is just so few people do it. Even if you do it poorly, there's this guy. He's great. I'm not going to say his name, but he does a video every day, and it is so bad. But I know his name, and if I ever need that specific product, I'm going to talk to that guy because he is yeah. he's obviously good at what he does. But his videos, like it's like I mean, he does it like this sometimes with his phone, and oh, no. you see like his. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he just and he like he doesn't he can't figure it out sometimes and it's just funny but again i know the guy i know the guy's first yeah. and last name i know his company i know what he does it's, I love that. it's just a it's a weird thing yeah well time kind of got away from me it's actually the hour right now so yes thank you everybody that's joined if you have questions i'm happy to yeah. stay on for a few minutes uh i don't have a anything right after this so if you did have a question feel free to post it uh now and then if you want to jump on, I'd still be happy to chat with you. So follow the link that I posted and I'll, I'll yeah. pull you up and can answer any questions. I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. But thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you. For the show. Um, but yeah, Brian, I you could stay on if you want, but I don't know if you guys Okay. <laughs> Just to finish well, that I, thought. <laughs> let, me, let me get your hot take on something. So I talked to somebody yesterday, a prospect that I had, and they work, let's just say, in the financial uh financial not aid financial management um mm-hmm. yeah fi- like uh capital management uh, like an advisor a financial advisor yeah there you person. go advisor that's what that's what i was looking for and we were talking about content and they said yes we can do content but they, he, he's an independent worker contractor but he works for a large corporation and he said all we have to do is take all of our content give that to legal 
and then Leo's going to go through it and then they'll give it back to us approved to post. Right. And so you and I both know what's going to happen. They're going to strip everything that could possibly be misconstrued and, uh, and more right to the point that it's almost worthless. Like, have you run into that and what, what's kind of your hot take on that? Yeah, that's, that's brutal when people are working in an industry like that. It's kind of interesting because yeah. my we work in some industries that are regulated and work with some regulated companies. And I mean, that's always something that comes up. It's really, it's quite frustrating. He, my boss, Mike, is like, has pushed back on some of the marketing leaders we work with. And he's been in positions in regulated industries where he's had to make decisions that go against legal. Uh, but it's basically like, look, you got to, legal's there to advise you. And if you mm-hmm. go against what they say, they're not going to be held liable for it at that point, right? But they're going to advise you to do things that are like in no way, shape, or form ever going to lead you to a legal issue. And this, yeah. by, by the way, is by no means legal advice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the furthest thing away yeah. from a from a lawyer that yeah. uh, that you could have. But you know, the point is, great marketing is never going to make it through legal unscathed. Yeah, and so you have to decide at a certain point as an organization and as an individual, what you're willing to, what risk you're willing to take. And you do have to take a certain amount of risk to create anything yeah. that's worthwhile. Um, and, you know, well, I kind of lean into that, think, but. If you think about it, it's, it's like you were talking about earlier where your team can be a, a great way to scale your marketing in a, in a super positive way. And as a corporation, you're basically like who's going to do this, right? Like right. you may do it once and then get it back and think this is, I'm not posting this. Or even if you do just the, the barrier that you're placing there is going to stop 99% of the people from engaging. So as a company, you're, you're letting bureaucracy squash free uh, marketing. It's crazy. 100%. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that kind of, goes full circle with a few things that were brought up. I know Dan Dan brought some of this stuff up too, but it's, I think the real thing that I'm, I'm trying to evangelize uh, in the clients we're working with and as we're talking about these things, relationships are not just people who are ready to buy. That's so important. Yeah. If your sales team is going to be active on LinkedIn and they're only looking to talk to people who are ready to buy right now, don't waste your time. Mm-hmm. Don't do it. And if you're, and to me, I'm not a fan of lead generation because the goal is for marketing and sales to act completely transactional and only look for people who are absolutely ready to buy right now so that sales doesn't have a single conversation. You know, the goal of the, of the SQL and the MQL and all this stuff is so that sales never has to talk to anybody that isn't ready to buy right now. And for one, it's like, well, then why would we have a sales team and pay them commission? It's kind of, you know, takes away the value of that. Um, but then the, the other piece of it is, um, you're going to miss great opportunities that you would have never had an idea were possible if you're only looking at for that. So Dan brought up, um, you know, maybe one of your employees posts about golf and somebody connects with them about that. That could Mm -hmm. sound like, why would your company empower their employee to post about their golf swing on LinkedIn and making it some stupid analogy about that? Or, you know, why does my company pay for me to talk about, you know, eggs or trees being like personal branding and, you know, make that part of my actual work day. Uh, the reason is that person might reach out and start a conversation and go, Oh man, I have those same golf clubs. That's crazy. And then you end up having a conversation mm-hmm. about golf. And then two weeks later, that person's at a party and they talk to somebody that they know would be a good fit for your company. And they go, Oh, I know this guy, Brian, he's, you know, uh, he's, he's great. Yeah. He's awesome. I really trust him. I like him a lot. You should talk to him. You know, he does exactly what you do. And if you're constantly out there, you know, building relationships that don't have, that you can't see from the outside that are going to automatically lead to something, you're going to end up with way more opportunity in the long run than if you're just looking for people who are ready to buy today and only willing to talk to them. Well, and if you think about, let's let's say you're a cloud infrastructure company and you're going after CTOs at different companies, CTOs don't like to talk about cloud infrastructure all day. Like it's not, it's not like they're just like, oh, there's a conversation about cloud infrastructure. Let's get involved in that. But <laughs> if you talk about, if you talk about golf, like, yes, I do that. But also I'm a person and I have things that I, I do outside of work. I have a family, I have this, I have that. 
And those things, yeah, let's talk about golf. And then you you uh, earn the uh, influence to then talk about the cloud infrastructure or whatever the other thing is. Yeah, and um, I'm going to wrap this up here soon just because. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do need to jump off here. Yeah, um, thanks for jumping on, Brian. I really appreciate, really appreciate it. it. Yeah, I love yes. it. All right, thanks. Yeah, and uh, I'm just going to finish with one more thought here and then I'll, I'll wrap up the live. Yeah, so the interesting thing is on the topic of, of golf and relationship building and, and the value of you know doing some of these things that don't look like they scale in the short term and don't you don't see immediate return from them, but still embracing those. I was doing a, a customer interview for a client and they, uh, th this customer of theirs has done millions of dollars in business with them. Um, they were reflecting on how they originally got connected with this organization and it was actually through a, a golf tournament and he was a, gol a golfing partner with one of the salespeople on the team and they get talking uh, and it turns out that they had that, you know, the company has a, a product that was a great fit for what they're doing. And they built this relationship and they built trust. And because of that golfing outing gave an opportunity for a conversation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and then that's led to millions of dollars in business. And if companies take the time to look through their best fit customers that have been with them the longest, a lot of those are going to have come from some kind of a relationship, uh, whether that was, you know, a, a relationship that was unintentionally built or a relationship that was intentionally built to lead to a sale, there is strong relationship ties that lead to a lot of the, the best fit customers, at least for a lot of the clients that we work with. And so when we're talking about personal brand building, it's not just about getting out there and getting people's attention. It's ultimately about how do we build genuine relationships with people in the industry that have influence. Some of those relationships, I'm going to try to build intentionally like this group seems like somebody that, you know, this company would be a great fit for us. I'm going to try to build relationships intentionally with people there. But then there's also the relationships where it's just being open to meet people, being open to network with people and intentionally putting time on your calendar to have conversations with people you've met through personal brand building. And those are the relationships that are most likely to lead to the long-term growth of both the business that you're working for and your career as well. Um, so thank you, everyone who's joined us for this live. Uh, we'll be back again in two weeks. I'm going to be leaning further into this topic about personal branding. The next topic is it's about how to help your sales team activate on LinkedIn. And we actually have some resources that uh, we're going to give away for free to help you build, uh, help you empower your sales team to grow their personal brands on LinkedIn. Uh, so thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.